All right, welcome everyone to the third season, second episode of the book club. Our special guest today is Robin Reisenfeld, and we will be really kind of talking about the concept of legacies today. And so for me, this is a theme that really carries throughout art history. We could go all the way back to the beginning, um, but I, I really wanted to kind of keep it more contemporary with the, the setup of the conversation today and really talk about how this, uh, there's a through line between artists over time that we can draw. And for a lot of artists, there's more than one line that they connect to, but some of them are far more obvious than others. And I think, you know, for those that are really into, you know, mid to late 20th century um, art, there's a lot of lines that get drawn to Duchamp. And, you know, given the recent uh, two museum Jasper Johns show, it's always wonderful to put Jasper Johns in some of the context of Dada that, and in particular Duchamp that came before him, um, which, you know, directly connects to the invention of the pop art movement, as well as, you know, Rauschenberg's uh, desire for combines. All of these things are building off of the art and the concepts that the artists were using before them. You know, which then moves us forward into artists like Jeff Koons and Damien Hirst, who are taking these concepts and conversations further and further and further. But you can never really view them um, 100% outside of the context of what came before. You know, and, that, and there's a lot of different veins and threads of this throughout history. And one of the more famous ones would be uh, Goya's Disasters of War, a series of 82 um, aquatints that were you know, done um, during the Peninsular War and right after the Peninsular War. And they were, weren't published until after he had passed. But those prints had a lasting effect on artists and artists' desire to um, explain their time with their time and through their experiences. And, you know, so Otto Dix is a prime example of him um, discussing the First World War through his series, The Krieg, as well as artists like Diane Victor, who is a South African artist who's been making a body of work called The Disasters of Peace in response to the turmoil in South Africa following the collapse of apartheid. And, you know, and I've asked Diane Victor about how long she's going to keep this series going. And she says, until it's a safe place to live for all South Africans, it's not going to, this series won't end. The disaster is continuing. And so these conversations and threads go through media, through specific topics, and through, you know, sometimes it's an approach. And so artists like Christian Baumgartner is a contemporary woodcut artist and video artist, you know, really relates to the way in which she approaches her medium to that of Albert Durer and the way in which she uses white and black line shift. So legacies relative to the arts and artists really have a wide diversity. And, you know, for many people, this, this connection is what helps um, build a richness but for a lot of the artists, it's what provides a foundation to build their work upon. It's, it's the things that they've learned from the other art and artists and visualization. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Robin Reisenfeld, who is um, a former curator at the Museum of Modern Art, the Toledo Museum of Art, or head of the MA, Contemporary Art MA program at Christie's um, Education has written many catalogs and many articles and essays. And but more importantly for our topic today is an expert um, and enthusiast of German, German and Austrian expressionism, as well as how that relates to contemporary art. Um, so it's a rare individual that has expertise in both of those ends. And so the conversation we have today really takes full advantage of that. And without any more time taken up with listening to me, I'm handing this over to Robin. Well, thank you very much, Phil, and welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us on this afternoon, um, just for this afternoon discussion. So as Phil indicated, um, my discussion centers on the legacy of German Expressionism and its impact upon contemporary figurative art. Um, can we have this? Do, you, do I set up the screen or do you want to? Yep, you set up the screen, share. Ah, sorry. OK. Um, Sorry. How's that? Good. Um, that works. Thanks. That works. Great. Yep. Okay. So one begins to see a renewed interest in the figure in the eight in the 1990s with the work of Elizabeth Payton, as you see here up on the screen, who has been credited with the revival of figurative painting at a time when there existed little enthusiasm for narrative figuration and portraiture. So for example, in this work called Max, 
um, from the mid 90s and it's a small one of Peyton's small paintings. Um, she places this waif life waif like androgynous subject against an empty backdrop um, depicting Max in a moment of introspection and together with um, its rich her rich colors and handling a form it shares I think a very close stylistic affinity to Egon Schiele's seated boy as you see next to Max here um, from, who, which was uh, made during the early part of the 20th century in 1910. Okay but Peyton, along, she wasn't the only um, artist interested in the figure at this time. Um, also, her contemporaries, John Curran and Luke Toymans, were getting lots of recognition. But they were all somewhat outliers in their interest in the figure. And really, it's only within the last few years that many artists have openly acknowledged their debt to German Expressionism and um, in their own turn to figurative painting. Um, and so one of the examples of this phenomenon is a recent online exhibition titled Transitional Positions, which featured 11 artists, which were all women, um, and was curated, as you see here, by Eric Fischel. And so what Eric did, Fischel did, he asked these artists to pair a German expressionist work with one of their own and to comment on the connection. And so you can also see that from the date, 2020, it was um, organized during the pandemic lockdown. So generally, the statements these artists made um, revolve around how they reinterpreted expressionism's pictorial language. It's mark making, it's handling a form for their own purposes to assert their personal response to the world around them. So in this comparison here between one of Ellen Birkenbelt's cartoon-like wide-eyed female um, characters in profile um, next to, uh, alongside a seated nude by um, Otto Dix, who is associated um, with the artist from the Weimar period in Germany. Uh, she comments on Dix's distortion of form and his use of color and line to capture the started, startled mood of his sitter, who is momentarily taken off guard. <clears throat> and so similarly, in the same exhibition, Chantal Joffre, a British artist, who was another artist included, comment, comments on the influence of the popular German expressionist Kate Kolwitz, and her comments conveys how she takes her cue from Kolwitz's numerous self-portraits that she made throughout her life to document her grief and other emotions as she aged. And I'm showing you two, two right here on the screen. You see one from 1915, which was sort of her mid during, made during her mid-career, and then towards later, toward, um, 1934. Um, she's aged quite a bit, um, and it's actually, in putting this a little bit in context, it's the you know initiation of the rise of national socialism, which she was very disturbed by. Um, <laughs> So, but going back to Josh, Chantal Josh, she talks about how she used Colvitz's self-portraits um, as a source for her own pictorial diary that she created over the, over the course of a year to document a traumatic breakup that she was experiencing. So, and in the same exhibition, another artist, um, Jennifer Packer, uh, she, this image beautifully, I think, encapsulates um, this revived interest in German Expressionism and German Expressionism and Austrian Expressionism's use of distortion with her comparison to Max, Max Pechstein, the sketch here, who was a member of the bridge in the early part of the 20th century. And you can see from her comment that um, Packer is not concerned with the depiction of the anatomically correct human form, but rather, as she um, implies, utilizing the body um, to capture our interior lives as a means to access our interior states of mind. And in this final comparison, I'm showing you, I'm showing you, so four examples out of the 11 artists that were included um, is this work by Jenny Seville. Um, and 
who um, chose Egon Sheila to come compare her work to. And you can see, I think just, you know, right away, there's a pretty strong um, parallel between her work and Egon Sheila, these two female nudes. She, in, an, in her comments, Savio um, acknowledges Sheila's remarkable ability to convey human sexuality through his figure line. So you can see how both Sheila, he's known for relying upon the contour line, but how um, Savio uses this in her own depictions. Hmm. And um, this example also, I think, serves as, um, it, it indicates how today's artists are interested in the human form, not only as a means to convey emotional states, but also to explore the connection between human behavior and sexuality. So we see this in the work of Sevilla, we see this in the work of Tracy Eamon, who was Eamon, who was another artist included in this exhibition as well. So um, this exhibition also included an introductory curatorial statement by Fischl who in this statement, he describes his own discovery of Austrian and German expressionism. And I mentioned this because Fischl's, when I read this, Fischl's account really resonated with me as I had experienced something similar in grad school in the 90s when I began my research on the German expressionism. And in his statement, he talks about his experience as an art student at Cal Arts in the 1970s, at a time when figural painting had been declared dead, dead, dead. And his instructors steered away from imagistic representation and teaching the history of art. Um, so Cal Arts was famous for this at that time is why I kind of emphasizing that. Um, so he obviously rejects his art school training um, and goes on to become well known for his figurative works when he moves to Chicago and encounters the works of the Austrian and German expressionist for whom the figure was central along with the practice of drawing and printmaking, I should add. So through Fischl's contact with these early modern artists, he reaches the conclusion that instead of abandoning the past and traditional forms of early modernism, the human body could be used to capture a kind of content that can't be, could not be expressed abstractly or otherwise. So I had never before this time had really thought much about Fischl's psychologically charged depictions of American suburbia in relationship to German expressionism. But when I read this comment, it really sort of leaped out at me. And I realized how closely his early works, such as this one here, Sleepwalker, were indebted to figural expressionism, especially the work of Egon Schiele here, as you see on the screen. Um, and um, I, this, I think um, comparison illustrates this close relationship. Um, you see a self-portrait by Sheila and then um, this uh, work by Fischl of a young man. Both of them are in the act of male autoeroticism. So um, Fischl just sort of does a kind of contemporary take on a same similar theme. So just to very, very briefly introduce you to Egon Schiele. Um, he, first of all, his um, life his, was very short. He was born in 1890. He died in 1918 during the first pandemic of the 20th century, which has been usually referred to as the Spanish influenza. Uh, so he was only 28 years old when he died. Um, and he came of age in Freud's Vienna. So he's known as an Austrian expressionism. And he made drawing the center of his art practice. Even though he did make paintings, it was really his drawing um, aesthetic that drove his um, art. And he was considered a child prodigy. Uh, was accepted to the Vienna uh, Academy at the age of 16. He came from very um, poor means. Um, received a kind of a scholarship or fellowship. 
Um, and I'm showing you an example um, of this work that he, this charcoal drawing of a, of a young girl that he created while at the Viennese Academy when he was only 16 years old. And you see it's very accomplished, but it's really a pretty conventional um, depiction. Um, and this comparison between this portrait from 1906 and his self-portrait from 1910, I think, indicates how rapidly he arrived at his own signature style. Uh, and um, really starts um, rejecting a lot of the sort of academic sort of formal sort of uh, rules that he learned while at the academy. Um, he leaves the academy in 1909 during the, between 1906 and 09, he becomes um, under the mentorship of Gustav Klimt, who was really um, very influential in uh, propelling his career. So it is Sheila, along with the German expressionist bridge uh, artist or Brucke artist, uh, who were working not in uh, Vienna at this time, but were working um, initially in Dresden and then later in Berlin, who are recognized as among the first modern artists to revitalize the human form in the early 20th century. And to do this, they uh, freed themselves from the past. What that means is that they freed themselves from the academic tradition and its concerns with the notion of classical beauty and um, the harmony of the whole and anatomical correctness. And introduced a number of stylistic innovations to announce their new modern attitude to the human form beginning with the reliance on the contour line. Um, the, typically, it would say continuous contour line. Um, it's often gestural, so they're eliminating sort of the um, volumetric um, aspect of the human form, and also emphasizing figural distortion, as you see in these two um, slides or images up here, in order to upend and reject the sort of conventional norms of beauty. So the drawing of the Brookes uh, studio, which I'm showing you here, is by Ernst Kirchner uh, from 1906, and it illustrates one of their life drawing practice sessions, which they did, uh, the group did on a regular basis. Um, and in these practice sessions, they shortened the traditional three hour pose that one would encounter at the academy to only 15 minutes. In order to force themselves to respond to their models with a, sen a sense of immediacy, not to start sort of thinking about it too hard, basically. And in order to emphasize movement and fluidity over anatomical correctness, which I think um, this charcoal drawing very well indicates. So I also sort of just drawing back for a second, um, and I mentioned this to Phil when we were talking earlier, it was really at this time that the concept of the adolescence um, was first introduced as a stage of human development. And this visual rep representation of the adolescence appears as an object of psychological inquiry. But um, additionally, you see how these artists embrace the adolescents um, as their preferred models. Um, so as you see in these three portraits of slim-hipped and small-breasted girls, so this first one is by Kokoschka, another well-known um, Viennese expressionist who was working at the same time as Sheila here. Um, so in addition to rejecting sort of the conventional uh, norms of beauty, um, they are also turning to the androgynous adolescent model instead of relying upon more fully developed women, which was the common practice of this time. <clears throat> okay, so among these artists, however, um, it's Sheila who stands out as the most radical in his elimination of conventional formal devices. Um, and as this works here indicate he begins to destabilize the viewer's relationship to the subject through um, compositional means. 
And something he would typically do um, would be to eliminate the ground line um, that would situate the model and provide any kind of context. Um, and in these two works, I'm showing these, these two works as an examples, how he makes us look twice by drawing his model on one orientation, as you see um, in the um, lower registers here. Um, but then he turns the sheet 90 degrees and signs it, indicating that this is the view that is meant to be displayed. So the larger images indicate the sort of the final version. And additionally, he increases our proximity to the model. He, he transgresses, in other words, he transgresses the boundary of space and thereby decreases the voyeur voyeuristic experience that occurs when viewing the subject at a safe distance. Um, this was something that um, he does as sort of a matter of course. Uh, um, and Another artist who is remembered for this is actually in his drawings is Auguste Rodin. Um, so, I mean, it's, I'm not implying that the, um, Sheila and his colleagues, German colleagues, were the only ones who were making these kinds of um, innovations, but um, he, they certainly sort of took the ball and ran with them. And then Sheila, again, in his sort of radical approach to the human form, he con continues to develop ways to utilize to access his sitter's psyche and sexuality. And in 1910, again, he makes um, a series of nude self-portraits. I'm showing you just a few of them here that, as you see here, rely upon a combination of distortion, fragmentation, gesture, and of course, exaggeration. So I want to call your attention to the, uh, the work in the center here. Um, it's a uh, seated male nude. So this is actually a painting. It's a very large canvas. And then um, it's framed by these two um, works on paper. But it's roughly five by five feet. And again, he's only 20 years old when he paints it. And it's a really sort of, um, it's, it's quite extraordinary, I think, and illustrates how he directs our attention to his intense inner turmoil through his stretched and emaciated body, as well with um, including these like um, red details that you see with the eyes, the nipples, um, the navel and his genitals. Um, so, and then even I think more extraordinary is how he gives us this visceral view of his feet cut off and then his arms, you actually don't see his hands either. So he doesn't include any sort of extremities. And you see how his arms are wrapped around his neck and head, almost like a noose that leaves his torso exposed and floating against this empty white backdrop. So it's this, and then you see the discoloration of the skin. It's very sallow looking. So it looks as if it's a flayed corpse or a dead Course, but both belies the corpse, the body itself belies the power of the emotions that he's experiencing within. Okay, um, so by contrast to Sheila's very violent, psychosexually charged depiction of himself are the portraits by Paula Motorson Becker who's working again at the same time, this first decade of the early 20th century, uh, also dies at a very young age, at the age of 31. And um, she uh, creates a number of full length nudes of herself um, and is credited as with the first artist to depict the nude from a female perspective. So at the age of 30, she painted this extraordinary self-portrait nude with amber necklace. Um, this was painted in Paris in 1906. And you see, first of all, how she's not depicting herself in Paris, but against uh, within this sort of natural botanical setting. 
And she exudes a sense of calm and contentment. She portrays herself in a kind of timeless manner, relying on simpl simplification and um, a form and generalized facial features, which we call um, archaic influences. She was very much enamored with ancient cultures such as Egyptian culture. And you also, I think, can um, um, readily see the influence of Gauguin and Cezanne, who she studied very closely. She wears this, um, her signature necklace. Um, this, uh, these are amber beads. Um, and she decorates herself with these um, tiny pink flowers. But most striking, of course, of the, about the painting is her nudity. And you see how her breasts occupy the lower center of the image as they rhyme with the um, swoop of the necklace. She seems pretty comfortable with, um, in her nudity. Her pose is casual and she glances upward with this tilted head and sort of smiles, half smiles at us in this kind of coy fashion. Um, and during the same time, she makes another extraordinary work, self-portrait on her sixth wedding anniversary. Um, it is a deceptively complex portrait. Again, this was created um, while she was working in Paris. Um, she uh, stands naked to the waist. She depicts herself again as a kind of weighty form with simplified facial features. Her um, almond shaped eyes again match the um, shape of the necklace beads. And she peers out at us with a tilted head. And then her um, hands are and arms are protect protectively shielding uh, her apparently pregnant stomach, which I think is probably the something is the first thing that kind of pops out at us. Um, however, um, even though this was painted on her sixth wedding anniversary, um, she and her husband had temporarily separated. And so while she was in Paris, he was still living um, in the, at their permanent, at her permanent residence in Northern Germany in this rural area in this little uh, town uh, named Volksweda, which is near, near the closest large city is Bremen, if you're familiar with Bremen. But in fact, she was not pregnant and this painting is meant um, as a symbolic depiction of her assertion as an artist at this time and how for the first time in her life, uh, she's able to paint freely and in a manner that she herself wished. And so in other words, it's a metaphor for what she's about to give birth to is not a child, but her mature independent artistic self. So she's really sort of, it's a metaphor for asserting her um, independence as an artist. <clears throat> so I also included another work by her, Nude Mother and Child, number two. She's also known for her mother and child um, depict, uh, works. Um, this one is remarkable. It's a radical reinterpretation of this long, long established tradition of the mother and child uh, and is considered groundbreaking. And again, in, in the sense that it is uh, portrayed through a female perspective. There's, it's not saccharine, it's not sweetened, um, it's not idealized. It's a frank, instead it's a frank depiction of a naked woman with pubic hair and all, embracing her infant in an unidealized manner while conveying this kind of intimate and primal connection between um, the mother and the child. I also included this um, one of her preparatory drawing sketches. Um, she did it for them, I believe, um, uh, that you see in the upper right hand corner um, um, as, again, a study for the final composition. Uh, she, so Mutterson Becker was also known for her depiction of young girls, um, which is another popular subject for her and in her paintings as well as her prints. So she also uh, created several prints that are not largely known um, in her, that, that body of work is not largely known in the United States. Um, but she often um, depicted, um, made works that featured peasant girls or uh, peasant children, but usually girls from her rural community in Northern Germany. 
and she would imbue them as this um, center image indicates. She would um, imbue them with this emotional complexity. Yes, you see this somber child, you know, who is looking out at us in this very um, unsmiling way. Um, and I think it's a remarkable image because in, in terms of how much it anticipates um, work that's being made today, um, and, including the work by Dana Schutz. So I just, I included this, uh, this print by Dana Schutz, a, a recent um, work by her. Um, and I think how, you know, I am not I'm implying that Dana Schutz is uh, making, uh, uh, consciously making a reference to this work, but I just see a lot of similarities in how, um, you know, these children aren't, uh, aren't portrayed as being these kind of angelic creatures, but having this really sort of um, intense, but experiencing these intense emotions. The other thing I was really looking at was I was thinking about when I was looking at this was um, when I was comparing the two prints and I was really struck again by um, the design of the children, the two girls in the print and the uh, design of, of the, well, it's hard to say exactly what it is, but I'll just call it a dress on the, the child and Dana Schultz's work here. Okay, so um, I stated at the very beginning um, of this discussion, the figure along with German Expressionism, you know, has, has fallen out of favor. Um, it began to fall out of favor in the 30s um, or after the 30s, during the 30s, for a variety of reasons. One reason is because it became um, closely associated with populism. But I wanted to indicate that there was, uh, there had, were some artists who continued the pursuit of the figure and portraiture, of, um, and the one that sort of leaps immediately to mind, of course, is Alice Neal, who throughout her long career um, really was committed to the figure at a time when it was deeply unfashionable, and she's how she's only now getting her full due. And, uh, you know, of course, she's known for her uncompromising um, and psychological and insightful portraits, I think, which she, again, which uh, she was influenced by the German Expressionists. Um, and I'm showing you here this um, work that she did in the mid 70s. Uh, it's a sympathetic depiction of her daughter in law, Nancy, who sits under this uh, overflowing rubber plant in the artist department on the Upper West Side in New York. And then I wanted to call your attention to the painting in the background, which is painted in complementary colors, violet colors, which, this, uh, is, which is a very unflattering portrait of this woman named Audrey McMowan. Audrey McMowan was Neil's supervisor under the Federal Arts Program and during the 30s. Um, and I think it's um, a way of taking um, revenge on her former boss, but I also think what Neil is doing here is paying tribute, tribute to her impact, to the impact of German Expressionism on her work. Again, I think that's something that is, it's recognized in the literature, but it's, it's certainly not highlighted that much. But you see, um, you know, you see the influence through her loose modeling and handling of paint, and of course, like the focus on the figure. Um, but when I saw this portrait of Audrey McCohen, I was immediately, I immediately thought of the work of Carl Schmidt Relief, which is why I put this work in here. Um, I saw a really strong sort of um, parallels between the two works. Um, so the Schmidt Relief painting is a painting of Rosa Shapiro, uh, a very um, well-known uh, in Germany. It was a it was a patron of the German Expressionist, and so. Of course, I think it's a much more flattering portrait, I think, than of Audrey McCohen. But I think you see the same sort of use of handling a form and the way the human form has been distorted and also the color palette. <clears throat> so um, I think I'm going to end here because, um, as I indicated, there's a sort of other sort of 
um, direction that um, artists take in their use of German Expressionism, I think maybe embodied best by Kate Kovitz, but again, that has a lot to do with the notion of um, social protest and, um, and populism. And I think that would really sort of begs kind of another discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Um, if you wanna go ahead and stop the share of your screen, um, I've got some questions for you. Sure. One of the things that, you know, you and I have talked a lot about is the influence of not just uh, the German Expressionists moving forward, but the German Expressionists use of printmaking and in particular woodcut uh, to the way in which they drew and composed images, that very linear graphic quality to a lot of the work that they did and how that carried forward and you know so i guess for me one of those things um from a you know you being a also a print specialist how you see or have seen that sort of graphic linear element carrying forward into the contemporary artists that you're talking about um i think it carries through i mean there's some oftentimes i see direct parallels maybe more indirectly i think it carries through in terms of with the woodcut the simplification of form um and sort of the foregrounding the way to um and in that simplification the way they're they're wanting using the, the technical components properties of the woodcut or the woodcut to really sort of um, foreground sort of the uh, the main sort of um, their main subject matter. Um, so if you go, if going back to that example I showed you between um, Alice and um, Alice Neal and Carl Schmidt Rutloff, you know, uh, one of the things that um, when you when you do sort of study the German expressionist literature that becomes sort of evident is um, that not only their use of the woodcut, but how much their use of the woodcut and those properties inherent in the woodcut really influenced their painting style. So that's really what I'm sort of re referencing here. So when you, that Carl Schmidt Rutliff, that again, sort of, sort of, you know, whittling down sort of the human form to its essential parts, also the angularity that you see in those, you know, I mean, there's a combination, you can I also see cubism in there as well, but you see also that angularity. And I think that, you know, they're com kind of combining these different sort of um, uh, uh, formal sort of strategies. Yeah, because I guess for me, one of the things I've always really appreciated about the German Expressionists as well is that being, their linear nature really, they kind of toss the concept of painting through volume out the window and it allowed color to have a completely different role to serve versus color being something I was trying to, you know, inform a, say, a rounded surface. It allowed color to be more of a graphic element or even a visual or psychological element, which really exactly. to me like comes through like especially with artists like Dana Schutz or Elizabeth Payton's examples of how she was really using color more in a field painting kind of perspective or a psychological perspective rather than supportive of form. Yes, exactly. It becomes a way of using color in an expressive manner as opposed to a descriptive, purely descriptive manner. Um, and they also, as you said, you know, you know, with along with, you know, sort of uh, throwing out this use of volumetric, you know, form, there is not to say that they don't introduce perspective or perspectival space, but, or, excuse me, I'll take that back. They introduce spatial sort of relationships, but it's less through the kind of, you know, Renaissance notion of perspectival space. And I think that's something that Ernst Kirchner is is very very conscious of in his paintings um but and i think again that they're through their experimentation with the wood primarily the woodcut which was something that they adapted before they turned to painting they first were making prints before they uh, turned to painting you know it you see you begin to see a, um, a lot of um sort of sort of similarities between the uh the woodcuts and their painting style i think um yeah, I mean, definitely for me, I feel like, you know, Max Beckman is one of those artists that um, definitely learned how to paint because of his prints and his drawings. And I guess you know, when I, I project forward, 
too. You when you see a lot of the '90s era figurative artists responding to the paintings of the German expressionists, they're you know they essentially up, learning by default. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I'll, I'm sorry to keep interrupting you, but no, I'm. Uh, but yeah, to sort of pick up on that, I want to share the screen again. So. Yeah. Um, and then. Can you see it? Yep, we're good. Okay, so just ignore those, ignore those. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so what you see on the left are two works by, sort of to make your point. Yeah. <laughs> to sort of highlight your point, Phil, here, you know. Um, you know, you see these two works by Beckmann, um, this beautiful dry point and below this sort of odalesque. And then of course on the right, you see a painting by Dana Schutz. And you, I think you can, you know, it's pretty clear that Dana Schutz is who she's looking at here. Um, but, you know, in terms of the, um, the composition and the odalesque, but even again, the sort of the kind of handling of paint, the palette, but uh, to your point about how printmaking really um, influenced Beckmann, I think that's a great point. Uh, you know, I'd, I'm sure you're aware that, um, you know, he was originally started out painting in a very sort of traditional way, very conventional way. He was making these large history paintings. And then with the outset of the uh, onset of World War I, um, he sort of, uh, sort of hit pause there. And when he came back to making work and he was making, and he started making these prints, you know, he sort of changes his style completely here. And I think you, again, you see um, a real sort of um, strong sort of parallel between um, the, the print and the painting and the way that he's relying a lot in both of these works on line. Um, to um, render the form. And then, as you said, um, color is something that is used both to describe, but also as, as, an, ex in, as an expressive means. And then in terms of, um, so this is another work, you know, I was sort of um, the, <laughs> I thought again, that the, there was a really strong parallel between um, Beckmann's um, image on the right here um, with um, this couple who are embracing and how their arms are kind of um, sort of wrapped up with one another. And the work on the left, which is not by Dana Schutz, it's by Nicole Eisenman and um, a lithograph. And I saw, um, and I see a lot of German expressionists. I mean, it just leaps out at me. Um, I see, I, the Beckmann, again, the sort of similarity and the pose and the embrace. I also see a lot of Edvard Munch in this work. It just that That's, arm. I was going to say the same thing. You know, <laughs> right. he was kind of the, the proto expressionist. <laughs> you yes. know, it's like the yes. precursor. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because you know, one of the other things that, you know, that jumps out at me too when looking at these is that they all dealt with space as the experience of space or place rather than the representation of space or place and i feel like their line work their color everything really was wrapped up in that and you know when you're looking at that revival of the figure in the 90s and early 2000s it was really from a similar perspective that humanist experience of a life lived and the inner psychology of a life and I, the politics of identity but that space was always about the spaces experienced. It wasn't necessarily a mattering that it was represented exactly accurate, but more how it felt or how it was remembered in the mind. So, right. Know, yeah. And, and here in both, yeah, I totally agree with you. He, they're using space to both artists to suggest this, this extremely you know, intimate world, you know, it's only they that exist, right? I mean, the, and I think the space is really kind of um, used to kind of emphasize that. Um, and, you know, in the case of the Nicole Eisenman, you know, she, again, you only see, you don't, 
you only see the couple, you don't see what's going on behind them um, and everything in the couple in both of these works, you know, it's the couple who's brought to the foreground and then the treatment of, and of course in the Beckbond, he cuts off, you know, anything around them. So, you know, they're really kind of um, using space to um, indicate this very um, intimate um, and sort of interior moment, I think, and then connection between the two figures as well. I think it's, you know, how they are sort of, we understand them more as a unit, I think, than as individuals. Right, yeah, and it, you know, it's, it's kind of an uncanny um, projection of the way a lot of cinema would go. There's like a theater aspect to a right. lot of the work that they do, which is, you know, that like you going back to the voyeurism that you were discussing that narrow space between the audience us as a viewer and the you know the actors on the stage so to speak that that intimate relationship that occurs in that theater setting seems to really be a major part of that kind of desire for that inner psychology to be present and you know and some of that abstractedness of you think of like if you sit front row at the theater your perspective on the people is really different than say like standard portrait uh, painting with someone sitting in a very specific three quarter view and, you know, dead on perspective. You're getting all these warped distortions based on your, your presence. And you're also getting the experience of that time wrapped up into one. So, you know, you, you really get a sense of all of that, um, especially, you know, projecting forward to the contemporary artists too, about that, um, that desire to really, put the audience in a much more intimate relationship with what it is that they have to say subject wise with their paintings and their, and their prints. For me, you know, mm -hmm. what I was just gonna say, we, we recently, you know, the last, last time we had this discussion, the, the Paula Mosen, Mosen Becker work was, was brand new to me. I had never seen her work before and was, you know, grateful to have seen it because I think something also to really talk about, and it comes through most clearly with her, and I'd love for you to talk a bit more about it, is the confidence of the representation of the human form, which is so different than oh, the way in which you see like the human figure represented so much throughout art history, um, whether it be I guess this to me is, is more reminiscent of East Asian representations, like especially during the Yukioi period of how the figure was represented as far as a very confident stance of a figure. And it didn't necessarily appear so much in European painting, but you get this, this sense of confidence here that is so, so strikingly different. I think we take it a little bit for granted today. Um, but if you just want to talk a little bit more about that confidence, because you just, I agree, if you look at the other work at this time, you don't see it. You're right. She was very confident, very driven, and you're right to uh, indicate that was an exception. This was a time when um, women were still excluded from um, the academy and from, I mean, it was, you know, typical artist education was to learn to draw the human figure from the nude. They were not allowed in these, um, you know, these classes. So she was, she betrays, she's exceptional in that way, I think. So she, and I mean, I, I and, and this was partially why she left her husband, quite frankly, because he was very traditional um, and um, he was slightly older than her as well. And they lived in this rural area in this artist colony. Uh, she was, uh, her husband had a daughter from a previous marriage. And so, you know, it was her leaving was really, you know, going to Paris was a way of breaking away from him and his his values basically and I also his her husband was a painter as well but he was very traditional in his approach um and so it was actually she she would go to Paris quite often this was her last trip um and it was there where she you know she really she she met some of the artists who were living in Paris that time but again she became you know very familiar with Cezanne and Gauguin who were not that well known in northern Germany at this time so I think that provided her with some confidence but from the get-go she and this you know she this was very very um atypical of the time there you know aren't very many 
um, female artists in Germany at this time. There are a few. Um, and I think also, you know, her relationship to, to the human, I mean, her, her wanting to depict, you know, women and children, but that was her world, basically. And I think that, you know, that's what she knew best and really cared about most as well. Um, and like her ability to imbue this child with, you know, a sort of some kind of psychological, you know, um, it, it has a component is I think also remarkable. I mean, yeah, that painting looks like it could have been painted like this week. Right. I mean, that's, that's, that to me, I think is the thing that stands out the most is how contemporary her work feels Whereas a lot of the other artists really does feel of its time. Um, right. You know, like when we think of maybe it's because of context and we know those artists, but um, you know, when you're looking, especially this one, you know, of the girl, like that feels, that feels extraordinarily fresh. And I think it really points to the fact that we have not had the voices and perspectives of women represented in art for up until very recent times. Um, so that's why it maybe feels so fresh is because it's such a different way of looking at the world. It's not this male gaze of looking at the world. And, you know, so, you know, for me, I guess, you know, thinking about the legacy of German expressionism, you know, part of it, it comes, you know, in talking with you comes forward about being able to think about where you're at in the moment and that that is a transferable thing like that being present in the time the psychology the human the human aspect of being alive is something that is essentially timeless and because they're not really relying on showing you backgrounds that define time or a place necessarily it allows it to stay contemporary well exactly and i think that's why she, one of the reasons i think she chose to depict herself as in this timeless manner is she wanted to you know really kind of, she 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 wanted to transcend her own time and be remembered and i'm not stating that you know just again she was very very ambitious she was not you know the but she was not a feminist she was just you know but she was determined to really become an artist, as you see. And she also, but I mean, something I was thinking about actually when I was putting this together was, well, her fascination with childbirth, okay? And so, and this, I think you see again, it shows, indicates that this is, these are works sort of perceived through the lens of a woman in the sense that um, she's 30 years old, she hasn't given birth yet. Um, there is a lot of pressure on her <laughs> to, you know, and I don't believe her, she'd been married for a number of years, her marriage had not been consummated yet. Um, so there was, you know, a lot of pressure on her to have a child. And I think, you know, and, and, she, and I think in a way that this um, self portrait of her sixth wedding, you know, it's, she's, she's sort of, it's a, she's at this crossroads and that's really what she's announcing. I mean, she's announcing her independent status, but she's also in how she's, you know, stepped over the threshold into the artistic realm. But um, I think she's, you know, she, she's really conflicted about this. She does go back, she ends up going back to her husband actually, and she does give birth. And I think that's a choice she wants. I mean, she does have a child. Um, and I think that's a choice she consciously made. Um, but then she dies, you know, like three weeks after giving birth to her child. So it's really, again, sort of very tragic. It's kind of the flip side of Megan right. Sheila, so, a curious way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, you know, in having an additional context, when you look at that self portrait on her sixth wedding anniversary, it's, it, um, given the power of that embrace of the belly and what that symbolizes and has symbolized, you know, <laughs> since ancient times. Um, it's really her expression that holds you. Like you keep being pulled down to that compositionally. So there's some really amazing, just formalist compositional things yeah. happening that you yeah. feel torn between where to look, to look at the belly and think about that right. or to look at her and what right. she's thinking, which, and, and then it makes you want to try to interpret how she's feeling, but you don't necessarily know um, she's not making it super clear. It's not like I'm crazy excited. I'm pregnant. You're not necessarily sure. And when it's, when you read the title and that's about a wedding anniversary and it's the sixth, 
that that time element of when a you know supposed to like especially in this era supposed to have a baby is significant and then you know the rest of that context i really think changes you know right. how we're looking at it right so i mean this is just one of those great tragedies where the artist just didn't live long enough for us to get to know to get to know her better through her work and what she intended you know to really say as an artist but the mother and child being that one of the few depictions of a mother and child that's um more of a real experience rather than you know some sort of you know <laughs> italian renaissance era depiction of of a mother and child right and so this is you know the reality of time and how time is spent in this you know really formative period for young children and for their mothers and so you know, and, I, I mean, guess, you know, are there yeah. other examples that you know of, of anyone really tackling the subject matter in this way? Of mother and child? Yeah, especially in this time. Well, I think they're different, but, you know, what immediately comes to mind is Kete Kovitz's, uh, I think it's 1903, 1902. Um, I don't have it here, but, you know, it's a, it's a print. It's remarkable where, you know, she, it's, um, you know, she's the the mother is it, 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 it's a pieta and she's embracing this dead child. Um, but the mother, if you're familiar with that, I mean, I'm sure yeah. you're familiar with the image, right? You know, it's just there's this sort of animalistic um, component to the grief the mother is experiencing. It's not this, you know, um, it, it's not this Michelangelo sort of, a, a, you know, kind of um, very sort of uh, delicate sort of, you know, depiction of the, of grief. Um, and it, it's, it's tender, but it's, uh, but again, it's, it's just this raw emotion that comes out and it's not the same as this here, but I think that both of them approach the human, the female figure, they both, you know, they're not interested in idealizing it or, um, I mean, quite the opposite, actually, you know, this is, and so, you know, but more again, as a, a way to um, access the kind of feelings, you know, or the emotion, and in this case, the intimacy, you know, it's just that this kind of prime primacy, I think is what I'm trying to say here, you know, they both express that sort of primal sort of attachment to the child in slightly different ways. And I, you don't see that in Renoir, you don't, you don't see right. that in Mary Cassad, who never had children, but you don't see that, I mean, you know, you see other things, but you don't, yeah, exactly. No, I mean, this is really, I think, the. First, I mean, that's why this is so radical, because you don't see pubic hair, that's the other thing. I mean, you know, this is so, which indicates this is, you know, meant to be, a, you know, a representation of uh, not just of a real woman in some ways or uh, or what women really experience um right so i guess you know just in keeping with the, the kind of legacy theme of of the conversation i think you know what comes through and what you're saying for me is that the experience being the primary driver of the work and how um lived experience or imagined lived experience uh, becomes the way in which to communicate um, to an audience for an artist and how, you know, it's definitely the case with a lot of the artists you've been shown from the early 90s and the 2000s for this figurative revival, but that's, that's really was their primary goal, um, especially with, you know, other artists, say like someone like Micheline Thomas or um, uh, Alison Saar, how the, how the figure is used in a very similar experiential based way. You know that you see a lot of and with a lot of artists who are addressing you know contemporary identity politics and um, body-based politics and things like that as well so i mean for you you know being someone who knows both of these body ends of the spectrum of this so well what's what's the legacy component that you see being the most long-lasting or prevalent well what i i mean as you were talking what i was thinking about it's the language is coded and I think that's what artists are picking up on. And, you know, seeing this nude mother and child as being such a departure from the typical sort of, you know, that um, depictions that previous, you know, it, it jumps out at you because it, it basically announces like, yeah, you know, I get it. I mean, there's, this is, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it's, lead, it's wanting you to make certain kinds of connections that you wouldn't make with, 
you know, prior sort of depictions of mother and child. And I think it's, and so in this case, in this case here too, you know, it's, it's coded in the sense that, you know, that not to say that these are works um, that you understand as being uh, depicted by, through another sensibility than a non, you know, in the case of, a, or a purely, you know, female perspective in some ways. I mean, um, I think that's what leaps out to me. Um, I think the fact that, um, and then I think that's picked up actually, wait, sorry, the other way, very much picked up by Dana Schutz. Right. And she understands, she's under, she's looking at Beckmann's language, which is actually pictorial language, it's pretty complex. And it's, it's, he created this kind of personal sort of, you know, you know, pictorial vocabulary in which, you know, the objects in his works are not, uh, are very deliberate, you know, they're not accidental. All of them are sort of met the, 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 comp the, the musical instrument that, you know, the cat, they all are, you know, symbolic of, and you find, you know, the, what him kind of recombining these um, different, um, uh, the use of this different um, imagery in different ways, um, as well as this collapsed space. That's a, something that I think is very um, uh, true of Dana. She's looking at the way that Beckman uh, develops space. But if you look at um, and the way everything is kind of collapsed and looks like it's all sort of jammed together, um, but you see how Dana Schutz is, is doing the same thing, actually, but with contemporary tropes, okay? I mean, she's got fishnet stockings on, she's got, you know, she's this doll-like woman who's, you know, on the boat here. Um, you see the woman, the head, a Madonna figure, and then you see these two bird heads, right? And I think that that's, you know, an illusion. Actually, that's an illusion that goes back to Beckman, who often depicted himself with the bird head, um, as well, well, as well as Max Ernst. So I think you know there's these ways that you know. So what Dana Schutz is picking up on is again the sense of space, the way he creates space, but also the use of um, different kinds of objects um, to create a narrative, create a story, to tell a story. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's a big part of their legacy is they have a story to tell that has, right. you know, that deals with the internal psychology of, of people. And it's not just this macro view or, um, you know, larger allegorical way of looking at the world. It's really more from that, you know, lived experience perspective. Exactly. But it's also, you know, it's told from a personal view, but what Dana Schutz very much shares with Beckman is it's not the rejection of the, the larger world. And that's, you know, Dana Schutz is very much interested in, you know, what's going on at, during our time, social issues and, you know, very pressing concerns. And so it's really a combination of, you know, creating this personal sort of uh, pictorial language and then inserting it within this large, like larger context. And in her case, you know, contemporary times and what's going on in our contemporary world. And, you know, you see the sharks kind of swirling around here, you know. So again, a lot of her work is based upon contemporary events is, is as is Beckman's, but it takes some, you know, some time really, I think to um, access that because you have to learn a little bit more about how they both use their, you know, personal pictorial vocabulary. Right. right. Um, I want to open it up at this point for any questions that anyone might have. If you want to stop your screen share, yeah, then if, if anyone's got any questions um, for Robin today on this subject based on what you've seen or been thinking about, um, now's a good time. Um, I will, uh, you guys can put them, either speak them out or go ahead and put them in the chat, whichever way. We have a smaller group so we can go with conversation. Um, yeah, I would love to hear your feedback, your, some of your observations. Because, you know, one of the, one of the other things that kind of um, stands out to me, you know, with the initial comparison with Elizabeth Payton and um, Egon Sheila is, is, is really that, um, 
kind of the the sense of the extraordinary and the ordinary, even though Peyton was using a lot of um, famous people as the subject matter, it wasn't really the it wasn't she wasn't painting famous people in that way, so to speak. It was almost like the subject, once you knew who it was, it may not be immediately recognizable, changes your context of it, but that there's this this kind of uplifting of of the figure, you know, in a in a in a very different way, not the like porcelain marble kind of aesthetic way on a pedestal, but but it's this kind of championing of the figure in a completely um, different way. And I'm wondering how um, how you feel about like that use of the figure, like that, because that that to me seems like a pretty stark difference if there's anything that you have to comment on that kind of way that the figure is even just presented. Are you asking me? Yeah, I'm asking you. Yeah, I'm asking you. Yeah. Uh, of how the difference between Peyton and... So uh, differences or, or similarities in the, in the use of that way. It's really more about the similarities of, of the use of the figure in that way, right? Because like Sheila is so good at... at putting the figure in a space without the space ever having been the needed to be depicted. Right. You know, and so, and how that kind of, I guess how you see other artists in a contemporary way using that device. Well, I think another thing that they are, pick, the contemporary artists are picking up on is, well, so what you're referring to is the notion of the everyday, actually, that the German expressionists embrace. Um, you know, that these people don't have to be, you know, the subjects that they depict don't have to be, you know, out of history books, but, you know, they're sort of, but, you know, it's this interesting kind of um, expressing, the, you know, the everyday experiences one encounters and with, and, and taking a subject who is representative, you know, of that. Of, of one's time, but also it's not somebody who you can say, oh, he's a famous, you know, television, you know, um, comedian or something like that, right. you know, and which is what Elizabeth Payton is one of the things she's known for, but then elevating them, you know, sort of, you know, sort of um, by not including any other context is really sort of just in just directing our attention on them. It's announcing their, um, their importance, basically, their, you know, and that they should be recognized. Yeah, we had a, a question that came in um, from the chat here. This, you know, the, it's about the um, attention by the artist to draw from the past. How conscious or subconscious um, is some of this? If you want to speak a little bit to, you know, some of these artists, how much do they talk about, you know, their obvious connections, visual connections to the this period on how much do you know from your critics eye sure. yeah you know, you know how, how much how much are they consciously or, or uh unconsciously you know referring to it well some do some talk about it you know uh deliberate i mean uh nicole eisman has talked about you know her interest in edvard monk and um dana should acknowledge is um her interest in the German Expressionists and Beckmann. Um, more recently, earlier, she was very much um, interested in Emil Nolde. Um, and but yeah, I mean, um, uh, and even Elizabeth Payton. But yeah, sometimes you know they'll just sort of shrug it off. Um, but that's you know that's not too um, unusual actually. You know they don't always want to how conscious are they are I mean I would say you know to me to for me I mean I don't know how conscious they are but if but I will say that if I see one work by them and it reminds me of a Germanist expressionist I'll say oh yeah that's interesting but if I start seeing 10 works by them that you know we should that <laughs> right. show you know then I you know to me it's very obvious where you know they've been looking so regardless if they acknowledge it or not yeah i mean and sometimes uh they're looking and they don't realize the looking has influenced right because they're in the middle of their own work well, i think what they may not recognize again is your point about printmaking and it's you know it's intersection with painting and i think you know because again i can't emphasize enough through my own research you know that i've learned from my own research is how much 
you know, the printmaking of these artists did inform their painting. So that's what I think often goes unrecognized or unacknowledged. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, especially with the German expressions, I mean, they, they didn't have any money. The way they were making work was making woodcuts and they often used really poor quality wood, like scrap. And um, I think it's, you know, they learned how to become the artists they were through their drawing and their printmaking practices. You know, and I think yeah, it's, to me, especially if you look at a lot of the German expressions, early paintings, they're not very good, quote unquote, paintings. You can tell they're trying to figure it out. And when they yeah, all embrace, they are, they embrace their linear, when they embrace right. their linear abilities right. that they it, develop so well, they get, make great paintings. And it's the printmaking that gives that that kind of really sort of, I mean, not solely, but it's really, it, one of the things it provides them with is a kind of rigor, I think, you mm -hmm. know, and, you know, a uh, sense of, con of control, I guess, or a rigor, basically. But also they're making prints collaboratively. So they're kind of, you know, playing off of one another. But I really think that it's the printmaking that, you know, like we sort of, you mentioned earlier, it forces them to really, or maybe what I said too, is sort of, you know, uh, decide what is important and what to exclude and not to exclude. That's part of it in their paintings, but part of it is I see the same mark making. And if you put up a Kirchner painting from his Berlin period with those striated lines, right? I mean, it's sort of what you were sort of inter when you introduced the Durer, you know, and you you look at one of his prints. Okay, and you see that same mark making and you see the perspective, the way he handles space as well. It's, you know, it comes right out of his printmaking practice, what right. kind of practice. Right, and, it, and it's, you know, so much of that, I think really helped. Um, there's a precision that's involved in the printmaking that's required in the printmaking. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that carries so much over, you know, and it's one of those, to me, one of the tragedies of Aegon Sheila is that he never really had much of an opportunity to do much printmaking. But you could opinion. imagine, yeah. you could imagine over time that having been something that was could have become more important just be based on the specificity of his his mark making. But his line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his his line, his line mm -hmm. drive. Yeah, I mean that that's a really interesting point. He he didn't like printmaking. It's kind of curious. Maybe he would have, you know, come around eventually. So I don't know. Well, I mean, yeah. I always go back to I mean, artists who don't like printmaking have probably had a really bad initial printmaking experience. He did. He did. <laughs> so yeah. you know, because it is collaborative by nature, like either yeah, the I, person who's teaching you or uh -huh. the environment you're making them in. And if you don't respond to that environment or it doesn't respond to you. Um, as a as a collaborating printer, the thing that I fight the most are negative prior print experiences for artists when I go to work with them because it's it's such a um, personal thing to make your work and to make it in an environment that's more communal and have it not work is more deeply negatively effective than say you try something out by yourself in your quiet space of your studio and no right. one knows you did it. It's right. it's that display aspect of the of a print shop that just I think mm -hmm. can be so Exposes much more psychologically you. damaging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you yeah. know, which gets back to you know the 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 the, the, the group they they did a lot of that stuff together. You know, and they I did. think that mm -hmm. helped them learn and evolve a lot faster. But it also you know required a, a level of trust amongst one another in order to be able to make that work in that way. Which yeah. I don't think can go without pointing out too. Right. Right. Yeah, they, for a while there anyway, you know, they would share each other, one another's discoveries. And, you know, um, it was, I guess it was Nolda who introduced them, I think, to, I'm not sure if it's lithography or etching, I have to go back and look, but, you know, there was like these different techniques and, you know, and so there was this, you know, a real kind of, you know, generous spirit there for a while anyway. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, I guess I uh, just a personal curiosity. Do you know, how the monk kind of jigsaw color wood block method actually filtered into the De Bruca group? Like, was it just that one of them saw a monk print? And I'm, I'm, I'm just curious about that. No, they were very familiar. Well, monk was working in uh, Germany at that time. So was, and then there was that, it was an infamous exhibit. They were very familiar with monk. In fact, they, um, when they formed the bridge, they invited Monk to um, become a member. So I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was not interested. 
but yeah, yeah, very much they were interested in, you know, Monk um, as a kind of, and Gauguin, um, you know, I mean, they were very familiar with the Fovis as well. Um, and, you know, their sense of color was really, um, I think, um, it sort of became revolutionized by their exposure to the Fauvist. Um, but right. as you said earlier on, the paintings they make are kind of pastiches of other, you know, of the foes of um, a lot large, it's, it's a funny combination and they're sort of taking all these influences and then kind of channeling into um, their works until they finally arrive at, you know, their own signature style. And again, I would argue it's their printmaking activities that enable them to do that, to right. arrive at this kind of, you know, um, really sort of singular style because they're they're um, channeling from the French avant-garde artists as well as Yukioe prints and mm -hmm. um, and Asian culture um, and you know folk art a number of different sources so yeah um, there was a question that came in about uh, uh, Paula Motors from Becker if if she was aware of Kate Kolwitz's work uh that's a good question um i i'm i actually why is this person interested in that that's a great that's a great that's a great answer <laughs> whoever asked that question do um, you have a, a response to why you're asking it um because when did um uh motorson becker pat when did she die he died in 1907. So really, it was just when, I mean, Kate Kolwitz had become known in Berlin, but uh, was not really kind of, you know, on the international sort of circuit or even, yeah. Right. And some of her more like influential work she hadn't made yet. She hadn't made yet. I would, and she was really a printmaker, you know, and sculptor. Yeah. So I would, I would guess not. And the other, and also, you know, there are, you know, these single women out there working away, you know, and they're not aligning themselves with other women, which wouldn't have gotten them anywhere. They're aligning themselves to their more, you know, established husbands, artist husbands. Okay. So, but it's an, I also think it's an interesting question because when I was looking at the polymo, some of her other work that I didn't show here, you know, I was seeing this really strong resemblance to the work of um, Gabrielle Munter. And I was wondering if there was any, you know, sort of, I don't know if they were aware of one another because Gabrielle Munter and Kandinsky were also in Paris in 1906. So I don't know. I think one of the things you said is probably the most prescient and sad, which was allying yourself with another woman wasn't going to do you any good. You know, so like that was the reality of the time. And in so many ways, it's still the reality now. And, mm -hmm. you know, as, as one of the problems with, you know, the evolution and, and art and as far as the diversifying the perspectives that get to have a voice, you know, so I think that that statement in and of itself is more revealing of the time and of the exceptionalism of her as an artist. That, right. that was her time. That is how she had to survive and right. to be able to make her work. And and with Gabriella Wunder, the same is true. I mean, she, you know, she was, uh, you know, she and Kandinsky were a couple and it was really Kandinsky who sort of enabled her career for, you know, many years, um, you know, in their sort of blue rider circle. Um, and uh, as, you know, and again, in my research, I've uncovered the kind of innovations that Kandinsky gets recognized for were really initiated by Munzer, but that doesn't really get, you know, get discussed very often. But so, um, yeah, it's true. At this time, you know, there were very few women and the only really way that they could, uh, um, you know, sort of become more um, recognized is if they were aligned to a male artist. I mean, I'll say that almost categorically. I mean, it's, you know, right. and it's, you know, it's a shame, but especially in Germany, especially in Germany at that time. Um, yeah, it's, it's too bad. Yeah, I mean, it just reminds me of a a uh, quote from Elizabeth Murray that I'm going to butcher because I don't remember it exactly, but when she was once asked about 
how she felt or where she saw herself relative to the history of painting. And she says, well, I don't ever think of myself relative to that because the history of painting has never been interested in including me or any other female yeah. voice. So I'm not at all interested or in, or in place with it. So she's right. like, I didn't feel I was in conversation with the history of painting. Right. <laughs> and I so know. I think, you know, and that's again. that outside of, of, but you know, but and here, that's, that's, that was Elizabeth Murray, you know, that was and uh, that, almost and that was 100 the, years later. When was that? When did she say that? That would have been in um, the early 2000s, I think. Yeah, that's interesting because it was really right. And the person who really, I mean, she had been kind of overlooked too because she was a Chicago artist for one reason, but because also, um, and I mean, she also, I think, has, you know, you see a lot of, I see a lot of German expressionists in her work too, but yeah. not just German expressionism. But she was, she was interested in the early modernist, 20th century modernist. But she, again, her career was catapulted, you know, into, you know, um, the public eye through Rob Store. It was, you know, he was the one who it was, you know, really for a long time, he was trying to get that exhibition that MoMA had, you know, right. and, and it was really, you know, he was really uh, gunning for her and it took him a long time to be able to get that exhibition at MoMA. Which was phenomenal. I mean, it was an amazing show. I mean, I was making prints with her at the time. It was right. It can't, it opened right shortly after she um, was diagnosed with cancer. And, you know, right. it, was, it, was, it was, I remember that it was really tragic. It was, yeah. It was really an intense, but amazing thing to witness her at her opening at MoMA that, that night. It was, you know, still one of the more moving things for me personally with an artist that I've known. I mean, she was well, that's, phenomenal. She is. And, but I mean, both her, that retrospective and the Alice Neal retrospective, I mean, what's so great about those retrospectives is because, you know, when you, is, you do see the early work and you do see what they're, they were looking at and that, mm. how they channel it. And if you look at a late Alice Neal, you don't necessarily make that connection, but you go back to the early work and it's just screaming out at you. And that was the same case for, with Elizabeth, that retrospective right. at Elizabeth Murray. Yeah, and you, you really get the, that sense of line, uh, how it that work was continuity. almost all line based in the, in the beginning, and then how mm -hmm. line evolves into edge by the end, right? So she's with those, all those small sculptural, uh, like little canvases that all group together to make the bigger piece, how, how that graphic nature of in her work becomes the edges of things. And yeah, I mean, you really, you can really, I definitely see, especially her like late eighties, early nineties work. You see a lot of, to me, like a lot of reminiscence to Beckman in particular with the way in which she uses line and paint and the way she does not care about the description of volume, but she makes, she makes volume essentially actual three-dimensional things sticking out rather than trying to, you know, render that she just makes it stick out. Right. So you know, I feel like there's a lot of, you know, pull that carries on with that as well. But um, we are going quite over. So I want to thank everyone. Thank you, everyone. For, for, for hanging out and that this will go up um, uh, in the next couple of days um, through my website to be able to revisit this and feel free to share it with others. Um, and if you have other questions or things for me, always feel free to um, pass them on. And I just want to say thank you again to Robin for coming. I'm really glad we were able to get a great recording of this thank conversation. You, and Phil, do you have a moment after this that I could talk I to do. you? I do. I okay. do. All right. So okay. thank you all for coming and I'll stop this recording and we'll see you again. Thank next you, time. everyone.